and welcome to the first meeting of the committee in 2020. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and anyone accessing committee papers through electronic devices should please ensure that they are turned to silent. Our first item on the agenda is taking evidence from National Records of Scotland on the draft census order. And I'd like to welcome to the meeting Pete Whitehouse, Director of Statistical Services at National Records of Scotland, Scott Matheson, Senior Principal Legal Officer with the Scottish Government, Scott McEwen, Head of Policy and Legislation, Scotland Census 2021, and Jill Morton, Senior Business Lead Questions and Collection Instruments with the National Records of Scotland. And I would like to invite Mr Whitehouse to make a brief opening statement. OK, thank you and good morning to everybody. Oh, try not to lean too much into the microphone. So uh, firstly, can I thank the committee for their invitation to National Records of Scotland today to today's session, which continues our important discussions on the detail and the substance of Scotland's census for 2021. As you said, you've got a number of officials in front of you this morning, bringing together our legal advice, our senior policy lead on a census policy and legislation, and in Jill and myself, uh, members of the government statistical um, service, and, uh, and as you've said, myself, as uh, recently appointed as NRS's director of statistical services. I'm very grateful to the committee for initiating and working through this informal scrutiny of the work that we are doing to deliver a census order and the associated regulations. As you will recall, there were significant challenges in laying the census order for 2011, resulting in Parliament considering the order on a number of occasions. This current process of informal scrutiny is therefore valuable in enabling NRS to work through issues with the aim of enabling Parliament to agree the census order for 2021 in a timely manner. NRS are working to present the draft order to Parliament towards the end of this month, with the aim that the order can be placed in statute by Parliament in April 2020. Working with this committee to help present an acceptable census order to Parliament for their consideration within this time frame is central to enabling NRS to land critical aspects of the census. These include recruitment of field force, finalisation of questions, which then allow paper and online forms to be finished, and a significant array of IT solutions built and tested, all tasks that involve procurement, contracts, and significant and ongoing testing. The consideration of issues such as how to support completion of the sex question or voluntary sexual orientation question confirm that there are areas where views diverge. NRS strongly welcomes the opportunity to have brought and discussed a number of issues with the committee through this informal scrutiny process so that progress can be informed and recommendations produced. Consideration of the census questions and associated support requires the deliberation of many factors, including learning from past census, the evolving needs of users, the need for consistency of outputs over time and across the UK, and innovation of technical and methodological solutions. These elements must be drawn together to deliver the timely, high quality outputs required by users as census outputs begin to be published in 2022 and through 2023, and thus meet our shared objectives of a high quality, timely census that meets the needs of respondents and data users. I'm pleased to inform the committee that since NRS's attendance in September, we have continued to engage in person and writing with stakeholders, many of whom are also directly engaging with committee. We've undertaken a successful census rehearsal, which tested our processes in three areas of Scotland, and we provided further written updates to the committee on a range of issues relevant to census design, including predictive text, ethnicity, and details of discussions with stakeholders. My colleagues and I really welcome the opportunity to meet with the committee today as we work to deliver a proposed census order to the Parliament later this month. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, and good morning uh, to you all. Um, NRS state that it believes a binary sex question asked on a self-identification basis provides the best balance in meeting the diverse range of user needs across the full census data set. Um, you have mentioned engagement with, with users. However, we know that a number of, uh, a very significant number of very senior 
academics who are data users, that is people who use population data, uh, have ex written to you expressing concern and have also written to the committee expressing concern. Uh, the latest letter is from uh, 80 academics led by Professor Alice Sullivan of University College London. And if I can just quote um, from some of her letters, she says, we're writing to express our concern about the proposed online guidance to accompany the sex question in the 2021 census, which advises respondents that they may respond in terms of their self-identified gender. The guidance acts to conflate two distinct characteristics, sex and gender reassignment, both protected characteristics under the Equality Act, and will effectively transform the long-standing sex question into a question about gender identity. We are concerned that this will actively undermine data reliability on a key demographic variable and damage our ability to both capture and remedy sex-based discrimination. And they go on to point out that because um, the census in 2021 is a digital first sentence that any proposed guidance will be much more visible uh, than it was in 2011 when of course that guidance was introduced um, without any scrutiny and they also point out that, um, that this will affect other data gathering exercises and I think it's fair to point out that that letter from those 80 academics is um, these academics are uh, leading lights of UK quantitative social science, including several fellows of the British Academy and leaders of some of our major surveys. And I'm, I'm just interested to know why you are so confident in dismissing the views of those people and uh, whose views you have taken uh, uh, in, in preference to those leading lights of uh, the UK Academy. Okay, thank you very much. Um... As you will have heard previously and as has been in correspondence, the NRS works very hard to hear from a range of views and to engage in written form and in conversation and in discussion with a range of stakeholders. We fully recognise that there are different views about how the sex question should be presented and supported and, and the role of guidance in that. In coming to our recommendation that we, are, that we have put forward, which is, as you say, for a binary sex question with self-identified guidance and then a voluntary uh, separate trans history and trans status question. In reaching that recommendation, we have to consider past censuses. So certain questions have been asked for, for a number of years, a number of censuses. We also need to consider which guidance was in place in the past. Um, and in some cases, there, there, there wouldn't have been guidance. But uh, in 2011, as you say, there, there was online guidance around um, that, that was there to support express user need in how to respond to the binary sex question. We have um, gone through an evolution, I would suggest, on, a on one of these issues. So you would have known as a committee that um, some initial thinking around changing that binary sex question was, was brought. And that was had there was a discussion that I think was with, you, with the committee which uh, changed that position. We've had advice and views from lots of different data providers and data users. And you're absolutely right. And I, and I, and I said in my opening um, uh, sort of contribution, you know, we really welcome people's views. We welcome the expressed uh, views of all of our different types of stakeholders. And the role of NRS is to put in place a census that that understands that consistency over time, understands the need for harmonization, understands the various needs of data users, recognizes the guidance that has been in place, recognizes the purpose of guidance. So we know, for example, on the binary sex question, which we, we took forward further testing that Scott Sen did on, on our behalf, following recommendation and discussion, I think, in September with this committee, that the vast majority of people are not looking at guidance in order to answer that question. They, they fully recognise how they wish to answer it. They use whatever evidence they feel is appropriate in order to come to that conclusion. And that is, um, 
consistent with how people respond to what is essentially a self-completion census. This is about people understanding the nature of the census and responding in, their, in the way that they feel best represents, in this case, their sex. Um, can I just drill down on this? Can you clarify which data users have asked for a self-identification question because of their wish for that as an output? Because obviously all these very, very senior uh, uh, academics, um, Professor David Ban, Associate Professor for Population Health at UCL, um, Professor Mel Bartley, Professor Emerita of Medical Sociology, um, I, could, I could list many, many of them. Uh, you've dismissed all, all of those very senior people who use population data. So can you tell us which data users wish for the sex question to be self-identified? I am keen not to get into individuals and saying that people have you a particular do, You do view. say in your letter to me that you have had meetings have, with data. Was, so who are yes. they? Who are so these data users that want that change? representation, which was also a letter where there was a number of data users. I've, I've forgot, I don't have... Yeah. Um, there, wa there were, there were so other there communications, a, but they were from academics in other fields. Many of them were, say, for example, in fields that, um, you know, in, in computer science or literature or and I'm sure they are very sincere in their views and expert in their areas but unlike these they weren't all uh, users of population data you know sociologists social scientists economists they were a, a different group of academics. So we have a whole group of so there are there's the consistency of how the question has always been asked and that question has been asked in that binary sense and a self-completion approach, which therefore our best understanding is that people will use whatever evidence they feel they need to in order to answer that question. Then there has been an express need, which came through in 2011 to ONS, that there is a group in the population who felt that they needed further advice on how to answer that question. At that point, the guidance was provided, which we also put online in Scotland, that the, because it's a self-completion form, because this is about people understanding how they are going to answer that question, the guidance therefore becomes one of self-identification. That guidance has been tested. It is seen to be helpful to people who need guidance. It has no impact on people who in the past will have simply answered and will continue to answer with without guidance. Therefore, it takes us to a position which I recognise is not the one that everybody holds, which is that the approach to completion is based on people's understanding of how they wish to answer that question about sex, and therefore self-identification is essentially the place where we go. And we are using guidance in order to help a particular group in the population who have asked for advice on how to do that, but also, and this is where um, we have heard from, from different academics who are saying that it's really important that we are clear about the guidance that is in place. So one of the difficulties, perhaps, if one went back to pre-2011, is that there's, an, there's a different, that what we are saying is that if we ask a question, in the census, it's really important to data users to understand the basis on which that question was asked. We are therefore saying that guidance in this particular position helps the completion of that question for those people who need guidance and provides clarity to data users for the basis of that question. Now, you're absolutely right that there are some um, users from the past and potential users going forward who believe and state that the question is being answered in some other way, our position and that of ONS at the moment and that sort of that harmonised approach is that because it's self-completion, because guidance was there in 2011, 
and because there is a stated need to enable an important part of the population to respond to that question and to seek guidance which will be important for our contact centres, for our field force people who are going to go out and in support people to answer the question, that we are clear the basis for it to be asked. And that is where we've come from. This is a practical um, position that recognises that under a self-completion question, people are answering that question in a particular way. I think you're answering, you know, the, the, the concerns by that very senior group of data users, and of course the statistics regulator did emphasise the importance of, of, uh, of meeting the needs of data users. You have emphasised the, the needs of a small group of respondents in terms of their feelings, uh, and you've, you've um, mentioned the independent research that you did um, well, the Commission Scott sent uh, to conduct. I mean, I would just put on record that m my confusion at the, the conclusions that you've drawn from that research. You, you, tested, uh, you tested the question and the guidance um, on, I think it was around 2,000 members of the general population randomly selected and 75 trans individuals uh, who were not randomly selected, who, who were recruited uh, through, through various contacts. Um, and 3% of the general population uh, said that they, that they wouldn't answer a question um, that would effectively boycott either the sex question or the census um, if it was asked on the basis of self-identification. Now, a larger sample of the trans sample said that they would, they would boycott uh, for other reasons, but if you if you actually work out what the numbers, how the numbers would translate, if there if if there were a number of people refusing to answer the general population, uh, there would be a high, far higher number of the general population refusing to answer than this small trans group. And of course, we don't know how scientific that trans sample was. And it's just you know if if. If respondent uh, uh, need is what's driving you to this conclusion, it, it seems a bit strange that you um, you have gone for the needs of one small group when a boycott would actually be far more damaging uh, if it was the general population, the 3% of the general population who did the boycott, as, as your research indicates. I, there's a couple of points that I want to, to pull out there. One, the methodology used by Scott Sen is well understood and is well regarded. They are a professional organisation that run many surveys on behalf of Scotland and across the UK. If their committee has issues with their methodology, I am not here to answer for them other than as a government statistician of 30 years. It is reasonable when you are looking at very small population groups in, in, in the wider population to um, take what is essentially a, a, a sort of, um, it's a non-probabilistic approach to getting information. This is different to the general population where you can take that probabilistic approach because you're looking at that broad population. When you have a very small group, if you just simply went out and asked 3,000, 4,000 people at random, you're probably likely to miss those specific groups that you are interested in. So therefore inviting them in a different way in order to express their understanding of the question is a legitimate way that many research companies use. But I, I would um, recommend that if there are issues the committee I'm, has... I'm not, I'm not questioning their methodology. They've been, very, they've been very frank about their methodology. They actually say since participants were not selected at random, the findings relate only to those who took part and inferences to the wider trans and non-binary population in Scotland can't be made. I, we tot we yep. all totally accept that. The point I'm making is actually based on their findings. And their findings said that in terms of the general population, 2,000 of the general population that they surveyed, they said that 3% of, of yep. that population so, uh, had said that the, of their sample, 3% of the general population sample had said that they wouldn't answer uh, a sex question based on self-ID. And I think it was about 61% of the trans sample said that they wouldn't answer. Okay. Now, my calculation is that, that if that was rolled out, and it is 
rough calculation. If that was rolled out across the whole adult population in Scotland who's answering the census, you would have 120,000 uh, of the population refusing to answer, the general population refusing to answer the census, whereas when it comes to the trans population, it would be about it would be about 40,000. So, um, but it's just you, you have made your decisions on the basis of the fact that you think a number of members of the trans population would refuse to answer the census according to certain so, guidance. Thank you. My, my second point then, and I'll, I'll ask Jill as well to come in on this, is that the evidence that we have over time is that people answer that question perfectly well and, and are fully able to. It's one of the best answered questions so people know how to answer that question and previous censuses show that people do that. So in terms of the general population, there is no concern that we have from NRS that people will not be able to answer that question in the general population. The guidance is sorry, there. Sorry to I didn't say they wouldn't be able to answer it. It's just that your own research says that because of their views on self-ID, 3% of people would refuse to answer it. And you are aware of the wider debate, and I wonder if you'd taken into consideration that there has been some discussion, we have had correspondence in this committee about it, that some people may, act, there may even be a campaign uh, uh, to, from people who oppose self-identified sex not to answer the question. Have you taken that into consideration at all as a risk? We, uh, I mean, is there anything, Jill, that you want to add to, um, to the previous questions? I mean, no, if it's okay. Um, yeah, no, I think, no, at this point. Okay. <laughs> so so our, we take, risk occurs across all sorts of questions. The census is there to meet the needs of a whole right range of data users. We will have a whole campaign that will run over the coming year and into the census and through the census, which will promote the benefits of the census, will promote engagement, will continue to clarify and support people's understanding of the benefit of the census. And we hope through that and the nature of what it is, which is that people are um, requested and required to answer that the census, that we will enable everybody across Scotland to engage in it. Now, as I said at the beginning, there are different views. There are always different views on how you put a census into the field. What NRS is trying to do at this particular point is we have listened, we have continued to speak to and have had correspondence, whether it's come to us directly, whether it's come to the committee, whether it is in the media, on television, whether it is to the national statistician at a UK level, and we continue to have those conversations. What we are doing at this point is putting forward our recommendation on how we can best meet the needs of data providers and data users to produce the timely outputs that we require to give the benefits that we do. And this is part of this informal scrutiny process that allows us to do that. I'm absolutely not ignoring the views of different groups. What we are trying to do as an organisation and have done over the last few years is try to balance all of the th these views so that we can draw together I, I, the best census I that we can. I don't think we're going to agree that you have balanced views, but um, we are running out of time, so I'm moving on to Claire Baker. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, convener. I just have some questions about the testing of the guidance. So the process that was done, there was two sets of guidance tested, one which suggested people at, um, have a self-identification response and one which was a legal sex definition. So I wanted to ask if the self-identification guidance that was tested is the ones that we've been provided with for the 2021 um, census and we don't have a copy of the other guidance that was given and did you test no guidance? So no guidance is essentially in in the assessment in the sense that what we understood is that the vast majority of the general population just simply don't look at guidance. But the guidance, but there's a link, there is a guidance there. There also, is a guidance Did, did everybody, there. both sets who were tested, yep. did they get presented with a question with absolutely yep. no guidance? So they were the presented with a question. 2011. And, and so uh, yeah, I think, yeah, there's the, the details in the report, but they, they were presented with a question and asked to, to respond there, and then asked whether they had used guidance in, in coming to that conclusion. 
Um, it was clear because of the way that uh, um, how people respond can be looked at as they go around the online um, system that uh, the that most well, almost everybody on the general population just simply didn't look at guidance so what we infer from that is that the vast majority of the general population does not feel it needs and does not look at guidance so in a sense there isn't there, the guidance that exists as it does for all other questions it's what i'm trying to get at is prior to 2011 the census that question was published with no guidance and nrs yeah. argued that the question has always been a self-identification question they make that a number of times and it's the a self-completion form which therefore leads us to a, a view that um, oh. self-identification essentially is where where we are best placed because people are answering that question in the way that they best feel yeah. represents their uh -huh. sex. So what I'm trying to get is why then was the... Because I think what you do argue is that the question's always been... It's been self-completion, which means it's been yep. self-identification. Yes. So why in 2011 the guidance was necessary and introduced? There was a representation to ONS in the first instance, which then came across to my predecessors in NRS, that... Uh, uh, people in the trans community were seeking further advice on how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. So at that time, guidance was pr provided, and it was provided online. So it was specifically to allow a group in the population who were saying, we need further advice on how to answer that question, and therefore guidance was made mm -hmm. in the context of what would have been ONS's and NRS's expectation at the time of how that question is answered, which is self-identification. Okay. Can I just ask some kind of more technical questions about the comparison between the 2011 and the proposed guidance for the new order? In 2011, when it said help with answering, it described it as no guidance provided, and then it described it as more questions. Um, that's, what, that's what we've been provided with. The 2011 sex question, it says, why is this question asked? Help with answering, no guidance provided. And then more questions, and that says, I am transgender or transsexual, which option should I select? And there's, and the new one then has its proposed online guidance. So it changes the nature of the advice that's been, it looks like it changes the nature of the advice. In 2011, it wasn't categorized as guidance. It was there as information. It looks more like this time it will be guidance. And then the, que the guidance has changed quite a bit. Um, and I was wondering why the change has been made. It's a much, you do have guidance for people who um, are non-binary, but the 2021 20, guidance for transgender is much shorter and is phrased quite differently. And in some of them, for other information you've sent us, um, when you had meetings, um, Sorry, we've got so much papers here. Uh, and the email exchanges that you sent us, you had a couple of meetings with a couple of academics. Yeah. One of the issues raised there was concerns about inconsistency in the wording of the guidance and some ambiguity in the 2021 proposed guidance. So I'm just wondering why the change has been made. In 2011, it wasn't categorised as guidance, it's categorised more as information. And in the 2021, the guidance for transgender individuals is quite different than what it was in 2011. Yeah, why I'd those decisions? I'd like are. Jill to come back on that. Guidance that we took into the testing, which is included in the Scots N publication that was published on uh -huh. 20th of December, we held a series of events with stakeholders um, to agree the two different versions of the guidance, one which um, would be for self-identified sex, one which would be for legal sex guidance. Um, so we had a range of stakeholders come along to those events and got to an agreed position with wording and terminology and, and uh, an agreement that that was, that was an appropriate set of guidance to help. Now, we refer to this as, as guidance on the online system that went out in rehearsal, which just says, need more help, and you click a link. That is very similar to the system that was an online system that was in place in 2011, which right. again says, do you need help? And you can access it. So I suspect the, the, the terminology between what we refer to as guidance and how that appears in the public sphere is, is 
possibly just us using our internal terminology. Um, we would refer to it as guidance, but as I say, in the rehearsal, it, it appears on the digital platform as a, as a need more help okay. button rather than <coughs> guidance for a question. Right, okay. um, so, so yeah, the guidance that we got to with the testing is, uh, was agreed with a range of stakeholders. That's all published and on our website who attended, uh, where we got to what the results that were. That was fed directly into this testing here. And as I say, the guidance that's used is, is in the published report. Right. I mean, you say a range of stakeholders. Do you mean people with a range of different views on yes. self-identification? Yes, so we had representatives of equality groups, of women's groups, of academic organisations. There was um, some representatives from, I think, local authority and possibly the health service came yeah. along. Because some of this, the, the 2021 proposed guidance could be seen as more vague than the 2011 guidance, but the response rates um, in terms of positive responses look quite positive according to the Scott. Um, the yeah. 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 Um, as I say, yeah. the, on a range of the different questions, we work with interested <coughs> groups to come up with yeah. a set of guidance that, um, you know, uses the right terminology, isn't going to be offensive, is going to gather the data that is intended to be mm. gathered and actually is intended to help people who may not find it a straightforward question to ask. I can have so. one final question, Greg Mira, thank you. Um, it was just again how the sex question and the voluntary transgender questions interact and do they, um, do they and do, can people compare the two? Because you give a, I can't, I can't find the page now, but you give a chart where you say if someone is presented, a transgender individual is presented with the proposed <coughs> guidance, it seems to be fairly consistent. A transgender male will answer male when they have the guidance, rather than the legal sex guidance. And a transgender woman will answer woman. And it seemed to be fairly consistent. This is what we can expect people to answer. But is that then cross-referenced with the transgender questions in some ways, so that it could be disaggregated? There is, is a range of, of I mean, that, that would apply to a range of different questions in the census where people are using multivariate <laughs> analysis to look at a number of questions together. Um, potentially, yes, <laughs> um, yeah, if a data do, user uh -huh. wanted to do that. Because in Annex A, which is the one from the ONS, is that right? Yeah, so on, the doc, yeah, on, page, thir on page 30 over to 31, it says, when processing the data, NRS will not be aware of which members of the trans population have a GRC in order to analyse the combined data for the sex question and the trans status question. It's important that the trans population answer these questions in a consistent <laughs> manner, and the self-identified guidance allows them to do this. So that suggests that there would be analysis of combined data, that the two questions are meant to interact with each other in some way. They could be used that way potentially if a data user but it's down to the data user to do, that. to do that. Yes, um, but it won't be just. I may have misunderstood something there, but we won't be at any point asking if somebody has a GRC. That yeah, no, no, I know yeah. that. Yes, okay. Not, yeah. um, we ask sex and we ask um, a yes no uh, and write an option on for for trans status or history. Um, in the similar way that questions around the health conditions, general health and disability are used together to produce it. That's what I'm trying to drive at, is if you're, if you're approaching the census with someone who thinks that the binary sex question has to be answered, that what they're looking for that is a biological reading of male and female population, or a, it would be possible for people who have concerns about that question to look at the voluntary transgender question and perhaps analyse that data in a, a different way. For people who feel that the data has not been consistent because it's including, because um, it's a self-identification question. So the academics who are arguing that this, does that make sense? The academics who are arguing this data has not given us what we need because it's not telling us the male and female populations. Um, that by the question being self-identifying, some people are arguing that changes the nature of that mm -hmm. data. And what I'm saying is, would the transgender voluntary question enable people to 
to analyse that data and take out the information that they are arguing that they need, that they think is more consistent? I think potentially, yes. Yeah. Uh, if I can, I think that there's two points that we're making. One is that the question has, has always been a, essentially a self-identification response. So there is the view that it was always based on something other than that is, is not necessarily the case, or I would suggest isn't the case. What we then have is the opportunity for data users, and this is one of the benefits of the census, is that people answer the, these multiple range of questions at the same time, is there is the opportunity absolutely for, use, for data analysts and users to, to look at the, the um, interdependencies or the links between certain questions, absolutely. Right, okay. It's not something that we are we're particularly focused on ourselves, but it's... It's, it's potential, and that's one of this um, sort of earlier discussions that we've had, is that we, we will have data users and, and analysts who will be looking to understand um, the relationships between all types of the questions across the full census, and that's, what we, that's one of the great benefits of the census, as it allows that to happen. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you. I'm Bill Ewing. Hey, thank you. Good morning, panel. Thank you for making your time available again. Um, just picking up a few points before I, I get to my own questions. I mean, Mr. Whitehouse um, referred repeatedly to the fact that the mandatory sex question is self-completion. Is it not the case that all questions are self-completion? Yes, absolutely. So it's not any different in that regard. No, Every single not. question is self-completion. It's the way the census is completed. Indeed. Is that so it's all self-completion. So absolutely. To, to sort of stress that with regard, that use that phraseology with regard to the mandatory sex question. Uh, it's not really meant to give it any particular significance because actually every single question is to be answered in a self-completion basis. I think the reason I, well, I know the reason I raised it, um, is that there's a suggestion from some of our stakeholders that the question was answered in a very specific way. And what we are saying is that as with all questions across the census, people come at it with their own understanding of what it is alongside the availability or not of guidance and they make their honest and truthful in the environment of they consider response to that census. This is a statistical tool where we, we are not in, individually focused on individual response. We are drawing together that evidence to provide geographic and population groups and other analyses at a statistical level. That, that's the point okay. I'm making. Well, that, that's good to have that clarified. To, that just it, it, Perhaps people listening might have thought that there was some particular thing going on with question three that was different Not to every all. other question no. of the, the census. Um, I mean, talking about the 2011 uh, sex question guidance, I mean, of course, that was the statistical blip because from the uh, beginning of the census, I think in 1801 or thereabouts, to 2011, there wasn't any guidance at all with respect to the mandatory sex question. Is that correct? That is absolutely right. the case. So it is uh, in that regard. It's, it but can I be viewed say as it's not a statistical blip. Well, maybe that's the wrong phraseology. I, I, but, I but bow what to it your is, greater knowledge is, is the a stati, clarification but for a group in society who are saying we need additional support in order to answer that question. What is clear is the vast majority of the general population do not need guidance and will not use it. There is a group in, in population who identified their needs in 2011 to ONS and then latterly into NRS that they needed additional guidance. That guidance was then presented in, in the manner of the understanding of the census that was being delivered in 2011. Okay, but that's the only time that that guidance has uh, been part of the process. That was the first time that okay. guidance was, the only was time specifically thus far. put online. Okay, yes. in terms of, and going back to Claire Baker's point, um, just to clarify, because I had asked your predecessor, Amy Wilson, on the 12th of September, the question, does the NRS testing also involve a no-guidance scenario? Amy Wilson replied, it is not specifically for a no-guidance scenario. I hear the, your answer this morning, though. I'm just a wee bit confused. Why did the uh, NRS not give that specifically as an option? The, the option of having no guidance? Uh, well, in their test, in the testing that you commissioned, why was that not a, a different head of testing? I just don't understand the answer that you gave to Ms. Baker. Okay, so testing no guidance... What, what we were given, what we were trying to, sorry, so trying to answer that, um, 
in a sense, we have got a response that shows that the vast majority of people just didn't look at guidance. So what we were saying from that Scott's own research is essentially that does tell us about how people access that question. So therefore, they don't use guidance in the general population, and they answer the question well, and they understand what the question is, and we know that people have used that in the past. Do, do, do you not do, feel in reflection that it might have given you a more comprehensive um, uh, outcome in terms of uh, you know, considering all reasonable options in your testing? I mean, is that not really the point, to I, I think, not prejudge, but to test across the board within reasonable parameters? But that seems to me a very we, reasonable option to have thought about, uh, I, but you have you rejected that as a... I wouldn't. We are building our knowledge iteratively so that we know that the census has been well answered on that question going back over time. We are then trying to address a, a, a specific um, set of uh, questions for us about how we enable all of Scottish population to respond to that question. And the testing that Scott Sen did, that we discussed with the committee and uh, provided, allows us to show that the va and we know from the past that the vast majority of the population does not need guidance, will not look at it, and is happy to answer that question. There is another group that, that needs it. The, then the Scott Send work then went on to look at some specific types of guidance, which was part of that conversation. So I think what we have when we look at our, the outcomes and the testings of questions going back in previous censuses, the work that we've done over the last four or five years, together with Scott Send, together with uh, sort of representation, gives us that full range of information. So I'm, I, I think in answer to the, the question, I am comfortable that we have answered, um, that we have drawn out sufficient information to allow us to say that the vast majority of the population does not need guidance, answers the question well. Guidance is there to help a particular group in society who have, you know, over a decade ago expressed a need for that guidance. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, you know, I can't really understand as to why you wouldn't have thought it would be worth uh, just testing out that. Uh, assumption. But turning to the, the guidance uh, at the moment um, and the recommendation NRS has made, I mean, if that were to be acceded to, what status would that guidance have? Guidance or in the mandatory sex question, what would be the status of that guidance as uh, a matter of can law? You, what would be the status of the guidance? What, what do you mean by status? Well, would it have a legal status? Would any rights flow from that guidance? What, what would be the status of it? I mean, if we're dealing with legislation and there's bits of no, other text it's, around it's had, that, we need to know what it is. As with all the questions mean. in the census, it is guidance that allows people to answer that question. It doesn't go further than that. So it has no legal status at all? It's not a legal status, it's no, advice maybe to Mr. people. Maybe Mr Matheson, that's his area of expertise. With respect, he might uh, want to offer an opinion on that. The guidance doesn't have the, the force of law. The, the, the Census Act, the Census Order and the Census Regulations will be the legislation and to the extent that there are rights and obligations which arise, they will be the ones that are set out there. The, the guidance um, will, uh, as, as um, Pete was saying, the, the guidance will uh, assist people who are being asked to engage with the census through com completing the, the returns. Um, it, you know, it, it's a minicle of evidence that's there in the background. It um, gives context to the legislation, the fact that the committee is uh, scrutinising it here whilst informally scrutinising the order is all part of the, the context and background. But it is not a document from which rights and obligations flow. It doesn't have the force of legislation. Okay, that's helpful. So, it, given that it gives context to the legislation, I presume, therefore, the committee will be provided uh, prior to making its decision with the latest up-to-date version of the guidance. The guidance development is an ongoing process, so... Um, yes, but I mean, my question is, if, yeah. uh, as Mr Matheson says, it gives context to the legislation, presumably we can't decide on the legislation until we've seen the final draft of the guidance. That necessarily follows in, in the sense that in previous years or previous decades, the order has been made and. Um, yes, but if the committee wished to proceed on that basis, presumably there wouldn't be a problem with that. 
Or are you refusing to give us the, the final text of the guidance before we make a decision? I don't know why I'm asking the question. I mean, the, the guidance is... Sorry, I'm, I'm slightly unclear about the order in which we're doing, so I'm going to need to both Scots to, to come in here. So we, the, the order that goes to Parliament and we develop the gui when do we, when is the guidance finally finalised? Um, later this year, but uh, uh, towards the end of summer. Yeah. So, so that's it all finalised and signed off because a lot of it just has small tweaks. We need to proof it. We need to you know check some of it with uh, would stakeholders. That take, would that take requested. until the summer to do? If it's just needing final tweaks? I think that one of the problems here is government routinely will issue guidance about legislation. It is, in doing so, it is trying to help the population who are need to engage with that legislation understand that legislation. For, the, for there to be a requirement, the government must always publish that guidance and make it available to the legislature before that legislation is enacted. It seems to have a slightly circular or, or um, chronological problem. We can't, we can't issue guidance explaining legislation which has not yet been made. So I, I asked for the I, final draft sorry, of so the when guidance. I, so when I, when I say that the, um, that the guidance provides context because it's being com considered by this committee, the papers which are being considered by this committee, you know, to date through um, through September, through to, to now, and indeed through the the formal stages when the uh, the instrument is laid in draft and considered formally by by the Parliament, there will be background there. So it, there's nothing special about the census in this. It's just a, a general statement that, to the extent that um, proceedings of the Parliament can legitimately taken into account in interpreting legislation and that doesn't mean that absolutely everything, every paper um, that is uh, available to the Parliament will have a bearing on the proper interpretation to put on legislation. But it's, it is part of the context. Well, I, I, I thank you for all your answers and obviously the committee will reflect on, on the answers you've given uh, because it's quite an important point, I think. Um, just two my brief uh, final questions, if I may, uh, uh, convener. Um, uh, the... Um, in the, again, the 12th of September evidence session, I think it was the convener herself who, who put to Amy Wilson that the, the, the proposition that actually NRS on, on referencing self-ID was actually seeking to jump the gun, in effect usurp the role of this parliament, because of course we are going to have as a, as a parliament that very important uh, debate in due course. Uh, it wasn't really clear uh, what the particular specific response of NRS was to that Proposition, so perhaps I could put that again today. Is it the case that NRS is seeking to uh, jump the gun on the self-ID debate uh, and thereby usurping the role of this parliament? So from, from my perspective, what we are doing is presenting a question that is well understood with guidance that helps a group in the population to answer that question. We are not jumping any gun. We are not trying to change um, or get in front of all the other conversations and discussions and, and um, uh, work that Parliament and others are doing in this space. What we are doing is saying that in, from 2011 and previous years, this question has been answered in a particular way. We are providing guidance to support that. And that is essentially where that census work Okay, so on that basis then, given the, the importance of this debate, and people have very strong views across the, 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 the spectrum about all the issues uh, and endless debate, would it not therefore be appropriate to include that language uh, to, to isolate this particular approach as being specific to the 2021 20, census and having no wider import? Would it not therefore be appropriate to include uh, in the guidance itself or uh, perhaps the order or whatever, uh, that language to that effect, so that it is made clear that a public agency of Scotland is not seeking to usurp the legislative processes of this parliament. I'm, I'm not entirely clear um, how how that would would look in guidance, but well, you the, could give it a, a give it a wee go and see, see what it looks like. The I think the, the point that I would like to make is that the. The census is a census. It is asking questions. It is gathering gathering data. Um, no rights and obligations flow. It's not as if it's by somebody uh, completing a census form and um, t 
ticking the ticking the the box to to indicate their their sex in response to the sex question uh, means that for legal purposes that is what they are it doesn't give them any any rights to be uh, treated any differently than than they would otherwise be it's an entirely separate legal question from the um, from the debate which the the parliament will as you say will in due course have about whether or not the law on gender recognition should be should be changed so they to my mind they are so separate that i'm not currently understanding well it, it, it is, might it might therefore not be a problem from the legal perspective just to make that point very clear because obviously that debate is still to come but again perhaps the committee would wish to reflect on that issue further and we can always write to you uh, further to that last brief question interplay with the, the 20, 1920 census act and the equality act 2010 we discussed that in the 12th september evidence session at some length a number of members raised the issue um on the basis that for example the two new voluntary questions on sexual orientation and on transgender status both of which everybody in the committee was absolutely 100 percent signed up to and supportive of uh, the, their inclusion uh, they were included further to the policy memorandum, memorandum on the basis that they were needed to be included in the census of 2021 to discharge the public sector equality duty and then the 2010 Act. Therefore, surely there would have to be consistency as between what we're doing further to census legislation and the 2010 Act uh, across the board, because otherwise uh, it seems to uh, beg the question as to the, the stated basis for the inclusion of the voluntary questions, which everybody actually supports. Any thoughts? Again, Mr. Matheson, might, he's our resident legal expert on these matters. It I'm grateful for you directing the question at, at me, but I think ultimately this comes down to a question of the statistical matters because it's about the uh, generating the, the data which are required. So um, as far as the the legal position, I don't I don't understand that what's being got at here is that the um, that the census order would be ultra vires in some way would be beyond the powers available to um, a, to the Queen and Council in making the order in Council um, by being in the terms that it is. I, if, if I'm understanding correctly, what, what's been got at is whether or not it, um, a, it is uh, appropriate to be gathering the data in the, in the way that's being, uh, being proposed. Other members, I'm very conscious that I've used up a bit of time and maybe other members wish to come back to that. I mean, obviously, if part of the census is absolutely expressly stated to be informed by the 2010 Act, it begs the question about the other parts of the census where there are relevant issues on protected characteristics. Uh, and it would be maybe more difficult to make the argument that those other areas are not also expressly uh, related and linked to uh, the uh, 2010 Act. But I am conscious, convener, that I've had a good innings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donald Cameron. Can I just return to the um, the, the question of uh, no guidance? Because it strikes me that given the, the guidance is controversial on, on the sex question, one way through this would be to not have any guidance. And when you were answering questions to Annabel Ewing, uh, you made a statement that said that the, the majority of people don't look at the guidance. That seems to me that's not an answer to the question what, if you tested it, what would people do if presented with no guidance? So what we, the evidence and the um, testing that has, has been put in place and has been carried out over, over a, a fairly long period is that the vast majority of people on this question will not answer, will not require a guidance. What happened in in the run-up to 2011 and what has happened in discussion after that um, with uh, um, certain groups within the population is that guidance has been sought. Therefore, to enable people to respond to that census and the importance that it has for data users and its use in, in all sorts of facets of uh, public um, work, guidance is being provided. It is clear from conversations that we've had that having no guidance at all is not helpful either to those groups who feel they need guidance in order to answer that question or data users who may have a different view on how the question is being asked 
or the guidance or lack of guidance that is in place. So this is both helping to get a full and complete um, contribution to the census, but it also clarifies for data users that this is the basis on which the question has been asked. They can therefore go and do the analysis that is appropriate to using what is essentially an aggregated statistical tool on that basis. Okay, so just to be clear, you haven't tested a scenario where there is no guidance provided? The you haven't tested it, you haven't, you haven't got Scott Send to test that? So what Scott Send did was ask people to respond to that question and then asked whether they used guidance or not and the vast majority of people did not feel they needed in the general publication feel that they needed to ask to access guidance previous censuses where guidance wasn't made available people will have answered that question and the general population they do happily and um, to a high level of quality and consistency there is a group that has been um, keen to get further support and therefore guidance has been developed to enable that to happen. That guidance is therefore important for people who are phoning into our, um, our, our support centres to help people who are out on the streets, helping people to fill in the question. So the guidance is there to enable people who need it to respond to it. Okay, can I ask... So so just add yeah. something to that, because yeah. early on in the development of the question, one of the first pieces of testing we did was to ask a sex question and see how people responded. So it was cognitive testing. Um, so it's not your large-scale post-out sort of test. So we presented them with the sex question with no guidance and asked them what they thought the question meant. And as we've found sort of similarly across other bits of development work, different people had a different understanding of what that question would mean and a small group said, well, you'd have to give me guidance because I, I don't know what you're asking me. So, so there has, it's not true that we've done no, no guidance testing. It wasn't included in part of the latest testing work um, because of the aims of that piece of work. Would it, I presume all the other questions have guidance. So it would look anomalous um, if yeah. there was no guidance to one particular yeah. question. Is that right? I mean, guidance it will have evolved over many decades in order to meet the needs of data <coughs> providers and to provide information to data users that this is the basis of the question and that enable people to do it. So I, I, I don't know, but I can well imagine if we went back a few censuses, the guidance was not there for everything, but we have iteratively built on that so that we are now comfortable and confident that this is enabling a full completion for this important product. Okay. All right. Can I just make the point in our last evidence session with you, that, which I'm, I'm sure you have, have reviewed, but uh, we, we discussed this in, in, in some detail, and it, it, it came out that in 2011 this new guidance that was introduced was accessed by very few people, and there's a big difference between 2011 and 2021 when you've got a digital first census uh, where the guidance becomes much more much more prominent uh, and in fact one of the things that came out in our last evidence session is that um, there were even LGBT advocacy groups who were clearly unaware of that guidance in 2011 that's how difficult it was to access uh, and that's the reason why some of these LGBT groups actually argued for a transgender question because the, at that point um, during your consultation, I believe it was Stonewall, had argued that um, we need a transgender question because gender and sex are different things and people don't know, can't answer the sex question honestly. Um, so we therefore need a transgender question. Um, and that's you know, another point for you to bear, to bear in mind is that that's the big difference between 2011 and 2021. We do now have a transgender question where people who... Um, who feel strongly about their gender identity can answer that question. And so that means that the confusion about the sex question uh, no longer exists. The testing and representation that we have is that the trans status and history question is well understood and is valuable and provide important information. That guidance is required and valued by particular groups in society to answer the sex question. That is just 
that is the information that we have, and that is what we are trying and you, to respond to. You keep going to. back to say that data users have asked you for clarity, and they want guidance. But going back to my initial question, I, I talked about Alice Sullivan's letter, the AT mm. academics, the academics, including Professor Susan McVeigh, who you have engaged with, who are all we really have. concerned about prominent digital first guidance, which erases biological sex as a characteristic. Uh, you. You have dismissed them, but you're not telling me which data users have requested this clarity. They have requested self-identified uh, gender identity to be conflated clarity. with sex. Oh, so in, in, the, in the papers that you've got, there has been representation from groups of academics, some of which, you know, so we listen to those academics and they have different views no. now so no the, the, the academics who use population data are very clear that they want a biological sex question are you saying that you've dismissed them uh, to listen to another group of academics most of whom are not uh, social scientists who use population data who might include you know professors of literature professors of queer legal studies that sort of thing i'm sure they're experts in their field but they are not social scientists who use population data i, I am not dismissing anybody's views and i was clear right at the beginning that we welcome the contributions that people have made uh, on this issue for for a, for a number of years what we are trying to do is build a census that delivers on that. The needs, the reason I talk about data users is that it has been noted in conversation and is how people understand when they do their academic or other work to understand what was the basis of the question. The information that we have had is that if there is no guidance, that is not helpful. Because even if people don't necessarily, at the end of the day, agree on the basis of how the question was asked or the guidance in there, they need to know how it was asked and the guidance that was supporting it. Because otherwise, people therefore infer something that isn't okay. necessarily the case. Right. So that's what we're trying we're not, to do. We're not getting any further forward on that. But Kenneth Gibson. Thanks very much. I was actually just tra looking up what uh, queer studies actually were, actually being uh, kind of innocent in this particular area, uh, convener. But the question I was going to ask uh, initially was, uh, can the NRS explain why the, uh, on uh, page 30 of your submission, um, the, the table outlining, outlining expected response to the sex question by population groups refers to cisgender men and women. I mean, is NRS aware that this is a contested and politicised term? that many people object to and uh, many people are completely unfamiliar with. Sorry, which paper <clears throat> are we looking at? I'm uh, sorry. Page 30. Oh. It's the table at the bottom where you say... Uh, 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 the heading just above the table says, uh, how NRS expect people to answer based on alternative versions of the guidance. And you've got cisgender man, cisgender woman. OK, I'm a bit clear on this. So... <coughs> Right, I'm just trying to work out which what, what we're responding to in here. Um, this is your sex questions recommendation report. Section six of the so this is our recommendation report. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so sorry. Can you ask your question again? Yeah, sorry. sorry I just sorry, want sorry. to know why basically you've actually um, used the expression cisgender and man and cisgender women that. Um, because this is a contested and politicised uh, term that many people object to, and of course many people are completely unfamiliar with. I mean, I have to be honest with you, until six months ago, I hadn't heard the term, I didn't realise I was apparently a, a cisgender. Uh, so I'm just wondering why you would use a term that I don't believe is um, um, widely used in, in normal discourse among the general population. I, the, the approach that... I, we can come back in more detail on this about what, how we've um, presented that table. The way that we use language, and as I think as Jill said at the beginning, is that we are trying to use language that is, that is understood, that is not um, seen to be in any way pejorative or demeaning or insulting, that we try to take a, 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 an approach that, um, that reflects our, our needs to be to be fully appropriate in all of that area. Um, I don't 
Personally, I'm not entirely clear why we've used certain languages, but we will come back to you. But our, mm. our intention, as always, is to be fully respectful and to ensure that the language we do, do use is understood and uh, accepted and recognised by the groups that we are we are talking about when we use certain terms. If we have not done that, I can ap only apologise and say that we will, we will do better. But I'm not aware that we have. I understand that those terms are, are ones that are, are, are understood and, um, and, and are not seen as demeaning or insulting. But if they are, we will, we will come back they, they on that. They certainly are contested by some people and I think misunderstood by many. I mean, I don't understand why you wouldn't just use the words man and woman, actually, there, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I mean, I think I'll, I'll, there's a, an element of frustration which has seeped out this morning from members of the committee because it seems to us that, or certainly to me, I don't, maybe I shouldn't speak for others, but certainly from our perspective, that it has seemed that from the start NRS has had its own uh, agenda on this particular issue, regardless of what uh, other people think. For example, the convener has talked about the AT academics, and it is the fact that NRS didn't want a, 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 you know, a binary question originally. Um, it was only after the evidence that was presented and the, this co committee was very, um, you know, w w was uh, overwhelmingly in favour of a binary uh, question that it's actually been changed. And you, you've kind of since evolved to say, oh, well, a binary question has been used in the rest of the UK, so that's probably a good thing. So the, 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 I think a lot of the arguments we've been having this morning um, with regard to uh, guidance, etc., and self-identification, it, it almost seems, from my perspective, and, I'm, and, I, and I would imagine from possibly our colleagues, that this is almost like a rearguard action being fought by NRS because you're, you, you, you've been kind of dragged as an organisation, kicking and screaming into a, a, having <coughs> to ask a binary question on sex. Um, I, I'm sorry if that is the way that it is perceived that is not the way that NRS is working or has worked. What my colleagues have been doing over the last few years is trying to develop questions that respond to user need. Part of the benefit, and as I said right at the beginning, and it is a huge benefit to NRS, is to be able to engage with you in the committee, to engage with the, the organisations who are talking to you, either individually or as a committee, to hear voices and to hear advice and get advice in areas that can help us therefore evolve what we're doing. The, I, the dialogue around the non-binary question, that has happened. There has been consideration of that and we are moving forward. It is, I, I don't believe that, I don't see my organisation myself operating in the way that you have characterised. What I see us as doing, as, as I said at the beginning, is working with you, working with the, the organisations that are coming to you, working with the organisations that come to us, working with our colleagues in Northern Ireland and, the, and ONS, to build a census that when the order goes through to Parliament and then the regulations follows, that those are broadly recognised as delivering the requirements of the census. We are having those discussions because it's really valuable to have them. We had them in the past. You made your contribution, others did, and we have responded. And I think that is a legitimate and appropriate way, given this is the way that the process is, is, has been formulated. OK, well, fully accepting what you've actually said in terms of that, and I, I believe you've, you've, you've explained yourself quite uh, frankly and openly on that. Do you accept, though, that this issue of self-identification has caused considerable concern among, as Gambino said, the people who actually use this data? And there is frustration that NRS does seem reluctant to take on board the views specifically of those who most need to access and use the census data, as opposed to other people who understand and may have given evidence to you, but who whom we, uh, of whom we're not really fully aware at this point. Sorry, the, we, we are hearing from a whole range of users of data providers and we are trying to respond to those, that variety of, of views, that range of views, not variety, that range of yeah, views. Yes, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. you, you've actually explained that to the convener, but we're just, there doesn't seem to be, we do seem to know who these other people are on the other side of the argument, if you like. I think there's a, we, we, we know there are, you know, there's 80 academics who've s suggested that the, the approach is, 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 that you've been taken is not the appropriate one, but we're not really getting any 
hard information as to who this these the people are who have a, a different perspective on that. You know, we're okay. hearing views, but not who is putting these so views there, forward there, specifically. There's been That's really representation right. in the press. Right. You, you've seen um, <coughs> representation from other academics. Now there are different views on who, not different views. There are views as to who should most speak eloquently and appropriately about these issues. Uh -huh. We hear from all different stakeholders, data providers, data users. Um, our job <coughs> is to put in place a census that people can respond to, and the purpose of guidance allows people to respond to that question and data users to understand the basis of it. Um, that is what the census is there. I absolutely recognise and fully appreciate there are different views. These will, discussions will continue. They will continue beyond the census. They will continue into social surveys. They will continue into other work going forward. There are different views. We have to put a census in the field in March 21, and, and this is our recommendation on, on how best to do that. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And Mike Rumbles. Uh, I want to focus specifically on what I think the intention is to actually get more people to complete the census. Um, I've been a bit confused as to what the line of questioning so far, because I thought that's what we're here to do, to make sure that the census is completed accurately by as many people as possible. Um, and it's interesting, in that your answer to Annabel Ewing, that you said all the questions are self-identification, because at the end of the day, this individual that is completing the census has to fill it in according to what they think is the right thing to do. Um, so your, your objective, if I'm not mistaken, is to get as many people to fill this in as accurately as possible. So in your report to us, you said on, on the same page 30 that Kenneth Gibson referred to, in the second highest paragraph, it said there was a 0.8% non-response rate for the sex question in 2011. So am I right in assuming that the guidance that you're providing now for the census is to try to bring that down from 0.8% to even less. And you feel that that's the appropriate way to proceed. Is that correct? That's correct. The way to get the best quality data from a census across all the questions is to have people, all the people answer all of the questions. So a primary aim is to maximise the response by households and individuals so to I the understand, census. I understand why Donald, I think, uh, asked his question, because this it's the guidance that seems to be causing the controversy. If you remove the guidance, would, would you get an even better response rate? But what you're trying to say to us, as I, as I am listening to your responses to other members of the committee, is that you want the guidance to be there because you feel that it will promote more accurate and a higher response rate to this. Is that right? Yep. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ross Greer. Thank you, Convener. Um, but to, to stick with the, the points around testing, I'm interested in um, the general population test and the test with uh, the specific group or, or, or subgroup of uh, trans identifying people. Um, the, can I ask if those who identified as trans in the general population test answered the questions in any significantly different way from the self-selecting trans group. I accept, obviously, in a general population group of 2,000, the trans subsample from that is going to be very small, and there are questions around statistical significance. But I'd be interested if there were any differences or if the trans subsample of the general population group were essentially answering and, and responding in the same way as the uh, trans people in the, in the trans-specific group. Um, I'm, at this moment, I'm not... I'm not aware that there was any difference, but what I can do is I can, we can come back with a specific answer to that. But I think you're right that the initial point is that the, the number of people who are going to be in the general population <coughs> survey who, I don't, who are saying have a trans status or transition is going to be very, very small. But what we can do is we, we can check that. I'm not, sorry that I'm not... No, that's good. I, that I think that would be useful and it may address some of the concerns being raised around obviously one of these groups being a random sample and the other group being a, a self-selecting group. So if, if it seems that they're responding in the same way, I think that would be useful in, in addressing that concern. Um, just to, to move on, another question around the, the guidance. Um, could you, and apologies if I've just missed this in the, in the papers that have already been sent, could you explain in, in the guidance when you were testing around a uh, uh, question based on legal sex guidance, um, how 
it was explained what legal sex was. Obviously, you can be in a situation where uh, your birth certificate and your passport can give different sex because you need a GRC to change your birth certificate, but you don't to change your passport, and they're both legal documents. There's not a single legal definition of, of sex. So I'd be interested in how, in terms of the testing, you were explaining to people, how, how do you answer on the basis of legal sex? Um, so on the final, well, page 101 of the Scott Sedden report, the guidance is set out there. So that is all of the information that the respondents got. So it, I don't know if it's useful for me to read it out. I suspect not. You've um, if you've mentioned it, I suppose it's worth, j ah, just for the sake okay. of putting it on the record, given that you've referenced it, yeah. Um, so it does say, how do I answer this question? The answer you provide should be the same as your birth certificate. If you have a gender recogni recognition certificate, you may record your recognised legal sex. Um, and then there's some other stuff about the trans status question. Um, so that is, again, that is a bit of guidance that came out of the same... Um, conversations with stakeholders that we developed the self-identified guidance as well. We developed all of this guidance at the same time with all of those stakeholders. This was an agreed set of guidance that we went forward with. Thank you. Um, and are you aware of any testing, uh, so testing on the same, uh, these same questions uh, by the ONS and NI, uh, SRA and, and how that compares with your testing? So to my knowledge, they haven't done this they haven't done the testing that we've recently completed. They do a range of testing across a range of questions. Um, but as far as I'm aware, this is um, a fairly unique piece of testing in the UK, but also internationally. So. It would probably be useful, given that they've, they've come to the same conclusions as, as yourselves around how to, to go about asking these questions, it would be interesting to look at the, the research they've done, but that's perhaps something we can ask uh, the spice here here in Parliament. Um, moving to the sexual orientation question, I'm interested around my, my presumption for why there is this um, autocomplete feature for the other um, response is around data consistency. Um, and I'm wondering if, if this has uh, been brought in on the basis of inconsistency in pr when questions have previously been asked that have had an, an open text box. So if you could just explain a little bit more around why that's the case and uh, am I even correct in presuming that this is about consistency in responses or is it about something else? Um, your consistency is definitely part of it. So it's a piece of functionality we have on the digital platform across um, nearly all of the questions that have a, have a right in. Um, there's, a, there's a range of reasons why we have it. One is because we live in a digital world now, and that's the way people are used to completing forms digitally, whether that be insurance, passport applications, shopping, booking your holiday. It's a, it's a reasonably standard feature. So from the respondent side, it makes it easier for them to answer. Very importantly, from the NRS side, um, it means that we have consistent data that we can um, code at the point that we collect it that introduces enormous efficiencies into the, all of the processes of how we deal, gather and, and, and process the census data in order to allow us to hit the, the sort of the output, um, key output timelines that, that we've um, put out publicly. Um, so it speeds up the entire process. So it, 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 in terms of consistency, it's not what response people might put in, because most of the write-ins also have the option to f have free text. You can type in anything you want. It is simply about cleaning up data at the point that it's being entered so that we don't have to go back and check some of that stuff later. It removes spelling areas, errors, abbreviations, all of that type of stuff, which is, from our perspective, it's those efficiencies in the system which have the biggest impact. But there is obviously the bit about improving the experience for the respondents, making it easier for them to understand and uh, answer, rather, not understand, just in a way that they're familiar with doing. That's useful, thanks. And, and finally, sorry just to jump back to the sex question, but I'd noted something and then forgot to, to ask about it. Um, we've mentioned before the pre-2011 uh, way the sex question was asked with, without guidance and the, the assumption that people were essentially answering on, on the basis of, of self-ID. Um, has any research been done around that, e either by yourselves or by comparative agencies? So, for example, ONS were functioning under the same circumstances. Have they or anyone else done research to understand how people 
in the previous system where there was no guidance were, were understanding that question? Uh, not explicit um, research. What will have happened I, during the, the discussions into the 2011 is that guidance was requested and, and ONS will have, and ourselves, took the position that um, this is how the question is being answered and is being asked and made that guidance on that basis. But no, we haven't gone back to ask people in, say, 1991, how did you answer that question that that wasn't done at that time? Because as I was saying before, the, you know, the vast majority of, of people across the, the country understand the question and how they wish to respond to it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I've got questions on unrelated issues, but I'm presuming for pressures of time, I'll just write to you with them. Does yeah. anyone else have questions about this particular area, Alexander? I just want I just want to thank you, Kim. I, you know, we've talked about today the the whole purpose behind this is to get good quality uh, outputs, uh, and you've identified uh, that through some of the testing that you've done uh, that when it comes to the whole idea of testing, uh, that the as it says the few people in the general public access or read the guidance before answering questions, and that included the sex question. <coughs> so the guidance that you have uh, is there uh, to support individuals to try and get the best accurate answer from them at that time. So that's a lesson that you've learned and that's continually being learned from dealing with this process. Can I ask what other lessons you've learned in going through the testing and you're about to do rehearsals and create a campaign uh, so that th there's going to be a public awareness campaign in amongst all of this because this becomes quite uh, crucial to ensure that if you want people to engage and it's a different way of testing this time or, or it's a different way of census because it's going to be more electronic than it's been in the past uh, so that gives you some barriers as to what might take place or not so as I say can I ask what lessons you're learning and how they will impact in the campaign and maybe your public awareness campaign that follows on from this. Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask others to come in as I say. Wish. So we've done the rehearsal, as you, as you, you noted, and um, what that has allowed us to do by drawing on, um, I think we went to 70-odd thousand households and got uh, you know, a fairly good response, actually, to, to what is a, a, sort of, um, a sort of test and voluntary scenario. Um, that has told us about how the systems work, you know, can we put a question online, can people get a, a paper question, can they phone up a, a, the control centre and get advice, all of that learning is, is being drawn together and we will be uh, producing reports, I think it's in March and beyond that, on that learning, that is feeding into the discussions that we have within our NRS, with our programme board and our executive management board and strategic board around that. So we've got all of that learning. That also tells us about individual bits of questions. You know, was our coding right? Did it, did it work functionally? So we have all of that, and that is the, essentially the, the purpose of, of rehearsal. What we also are doing, and we, this is one of the great benefits of, of us being able to talk to our colleagues internationally and also um, in the rest of the UK, we learn from what they're doing. So how did various approaches that were taken in Northern Ireland to, to send out a paper form to certain groups in the population initially, how did that help with response rates? How does sending a postcard in advance to say you're going to get a form, how did that help? How did um, certain field force use that we didn't do in Scotland in our rehearsal, how did that make a difference to how people engage with the census? So we will, we will pick all of that up as well. And then we have our comm strategy and our sort of engagement approach where we, are, we, we have uh, um, consultants coming in helping us think about that, thinking about how, how should we position um, television campaigns, media campaigns, um, influencers in society to engage people at a local level, community groups and others who are already engaged in communities, groups that help um, people who may need additional supports in order to respond to the census. All of this has to all come together over the next year so that when we go out in March that we have that, we have that looked. Essentially that we have made the best of our learning, we've made the best of our rehearsal, we made the best of what others are doing so that we, we are doing better than we might have done. And it's an iterative process because whatever we do in the future, we'll learn from that as well. 
And, and from that, you know, you, you've identified that there are sections of the community that may require support, may <coughs> require assistance. Uh, it's important that, once again, that you engage with them, because what we don't want to see is that individuals are turned off in some way. And, and, and we've found through some of this process uh, in, in, the, in the sex question and other things that have happened, that some individuals and organisations uh, have made some strong views and opinions about what's taking place, uh, and that has upset them in some way, uh, and they're not going to respond. Or, uh, As we've heard, there could be some individuals who boycott the whole process because they're not happy about how that's happening. But at the end of the day, you need to manage that. Uh, you need to manage that successfully, and you need to manage that so that we get the quality you want from that. Uh, and it's how you achieve that, uh, that it, that's vitally important. So there is still a lot of work to do in reality uh, over the next uh, few months uh, to get to possibly that outcome. Absolutely, yes. and we are really very focused as NRS to having those engagements and helping people provide their time to enable their answers to these questions meet the needs of data users. So there will be a big campaign around the benefits of the census, which move beyond individual questions, but to service provision, allocation and resources, everything from how we understand Barnett's allocation through to what might happen within a local authority. So absolutely, I take your, your, your guidance on that. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Convener. Um, just a, a brief question. First of all, has uh, any census ever had a 100% response? Not that I'm aware of, no. I, mean, I would imagine so, but I just I thought I'd no. ask nonetheless. Because it's certainly in, part, in page 29, uh, the final paragraph um, uh, of, uh, of your uh, report, um, it, it follows on certainly from some questioning from colleagues earlier. Uh, and uh, the sentence of the NRS uh, are aware that some non-binary respondents do not feel they are able to respond to a binary female, this female male question honestly, and this may have an impact on the census response for this group of respondents. Uh, so, in terms of the uh, the work uh, that you you still have to undertake uh, to uh, encourage people uh, to, uh, to to complete the census uh, when it arrives. Uh, but to also engage uh, with more people. Um, have you uh, have you got any have you well, have you given any further thoughts in terms of what you plan to do to actually achieve that and obtain that, uh, or uh, are you still uh, in a process of actually trying to work out uh, what you have to do to to get to that point of getting uh, more people to feel comfortable to actually fulfil and complete the census when it arrives. In specifics, we are, we're still working through what we need to do, and um, but it is, as, as we said, it is part of the work that we now need to do over the coming year to engage with, with all groups across society to help them understand the purpose of the census and the benefit of it and their engagement within it. Um, in a sense, as, as we kind of we talked about earlier, what we've done for 2021 is quite different to 2011. We have had this open discussion, this informal scrutiny of our approach in a way that's never happened before. And that has been hugely helpful in helping draw out different views, different understandings, and helps us put a census in the field that we think best enables that data to be gathered and used for the purpose it needs to be used. Once we get to a situation and, and uh, where Parliament is able to um, agree the order and the regulations, we are then very much into a process of saying, this is the considered view of Parliament about how we do the census. Then we must work with everybody across the whole of Scotland to feel that it's something valid and, and relevant to them. So we will be working hard to ensure that. And where there will be views where people are still concerned, we will do our absolute level best to, to help them feel that this is an important thing for them to contribute to. Mm -hmm. I can certainly come back to a question that Mike Rumbles posed earlier uh, regarding the 0.8% the, the that's on page 30 uh, of your, your paper. <coughs> um, uh, obviously, the 0.8% who uh, didn't respond in uh, 2011. Um, it might not sound like a, like a, a huge figure, uh, but when it comes to the actual planning uh, of, uh, of doing the research, but also planning for uh, the diversion of uh, finance uh, and, uh, and resources going forward, then it can obviously have a, an effect uh, upon, uh, upon those outcomes. 
So it's, uh, I think, that the work that you do have to undertake uh, going forward. Uh, and let's face it, in a fairly short space of time now, uh, is, uh, is quite immense. Uh, and the, if you do want to get that 0.8% figure down, and I'm quite sure that all of us in the committee want that figure to, to decrease, and then it's a, there's a huge amount of work still to be undertaken. It is. Yeah. Uh, and just one final question, just uh, it goes back to the question that Ross Greer uh, posed. Um, it's, it's regarding the, the, the versions of the, the online um, survey, because uh, there appears to have been kind of multiple versions of the, the trans and non-binary survey um, that, that, uh, that Jill Morton uh, commented on. I'd be keen to, to get further information on this, particularly we've got also uh, the wording and the guidance um, is different, obviously, depending on the version. There was one sex question with two versions of guidance. So everybody, no matter how they came into the survey, was asked that same set of questions, what is your sex, and the guidance and the acceptability. Because we had to recruit um, in a different way to ensure that we had a response, a sample size from the trans community that was large enough to now allow analysis, there was some slightly different questions at the start for that group, but the, the, all the analysis that's been presented, all of the same, all of the participants, no matter how they were recruited, were, were faced with those same questions and the same sets of guidance, and a, that bit of the survey was presented in the same way. Is that is that what you're asking me? I'm not sure uh, if I've answered uh, your question. No, no, it, was just, it was to just try and understand, uh, obviously, can, why there were the various versions, uh, and also why the text Okay. Um, and each version was obviously clearly uh, slightly different, except obviously they're going to have different versions, so the text is going to be different, but just to try and understand uh, why the wording was chosen um, uh, for so the, the guidance. The wording and the guidance, the, there was two, we were specifically trying to test if you have sort of replicating census conditions where you're faced with a question and if you choose you could go and get some question help on that. Um, there was the version of the help for the sex question, which was based on self-identified sex, which which says you know you you don't have to you can answer this how you feel. There was a separate version which was very much around legal sex, and you must answer with what's on your birth certificate. Everybody got those two pieces of guidance. Now that was randomised how they got it, so because we had to make sure the order didn't influence anything. Um, so that was randomised, but everybody saw all of those sets of guidance, and that same set of guidance, everybody saw that exact same wording. The wording that we used was derived out of the engagement with the stakeholders, a wide range of stakeholders, and we sat round in a room um, and agreed the guidance that everybody who was present and not present had a view on it and contributed to that, that that was a consensus agreement that that would be appropriate guidance to use. Okay. Uh, but just to stress, I'm, and I'm, maybe this is my misunderstanding and I apologise if it is, everybody saw the same question and the same versions of the guidance. There was no difference on who you were or how you were recruited. Okay, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, if I could just have a quick supplementary to the line of questioning by Ross Greer on the predictive texting around the sexual orientation question. Now, you do address this in your submission to the committee and you point out that predictive, um, the, the predictive answers to some questions are based on you know, very well-established surveys, for example, occupations and, and so on, which is totally non-controversial. Um, but with the sexual orientation question, again, you used uh, stakeholders and some of the terms... Uh, are not familiar at all to, to most people, including most um, uh, most people in that many people in that community, um, and you'll be aware of the the response to that. Um, you do indicate in your submission to the committee that you know you've still not made a final decision on that. Um, will you consider the submission made to the committee by the LGB Alliance? Uh, where they say that they are concerned uh, about, well, two main concerns is that sexual orientation, uh, as defined in the Equality Act, uh, seeks to be under, undermined and, uh, and trivialised, uh, is their view. Um, and they also make the point that uh, in answering 
say, for example, some of the predictive texting, if you answered demisexual, you wouldn't discover whether the person wa was uh, gay or straight or bisexual. They, they could be any of those things, so you wouldn't actually get that particular information. Um, is that something that you... Are you going to consider their views? Um, because they were obviously submitted to committee after this, uh, this row broke out, if you like. Um, I mean, uh, uh, it's... Guidance is not, uh, sorry, all the, the guidance and all the predictor lists are, all not, are not all fixed. That's absolutely the case. Where we are on the sexual orientation question at this moment is that those four categories of um, uh, straight, heterosexual, um, gay, lesbian and bisexual and other are well-regarded questions that are asked up and down this country and, the U and elsewhere in our social surveys and work well. So the four categories, because um, I think LGB Alliance, if I'm right, they were pushing, they're, they're, one of their arguments is the other category. Yeah. yeah. Basically, there's no controversy yeah. about the categories. Yeah. You know, they're defined in the Equality yeah. Act and we wrote but to you had, as a committee I think they about had that. Made, uh, it's the suggestion uh, that there are other sexual orientations, uh, yeah. which obviously the, the, that is, so, that's so a where, disputed issue. Yeah. Okay, so absolutely, their, their, their voice has been heard. Um, those categories are, are, are what has been well tested. When we are into the predictive lists, what just just for if, if you can just indulge me for for a couple of for a minute on this, how people engage with those predictive lists is if you are getting the form on paper. So this comes to you. You write in what you want. If you decide that the first three categories are not the ones that you want to tick. You go to other and you write in what you write. That's the way it's always, that's the way it is, and that will be fine. And for anyone who goes to the paper form, that's what they will write. If you go online, and we expect the vast majority of people to go online, and you decide that the first three boxes is not where you want to put your tick and you go to other, you will start typing in the, 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 the term that you wish to use. What we have heard from, from stakeholders and people who have, been, have expressed a view on this is that there are certain terms that people are likely to use. Therefore, for practical terms in terms of processing, to enable us to, as Jill had spoke about before, to quickly analyze and process that data to enable us to publish the first results in March 22, Predictive tests help us to do that. These are not the NRS's terms. These are not things that we have come up to on our own. These are terms that groups who represent and advocate for people who are likely to be in that category, which is going to be, I, I, it's a small, it's a fraction. Of a, I don't want you to put a percentage in there, but, you know, 95, yeah, that doesn't really 96%. answer the question that I'm putting, you know, I mean, like we, that, we that are considering the, the predictive text. We are still considering what still should considering. go in there. But yeah. as I say, the basis of it is not for us to put in terms that we have decided, but as to help us process those returns that people who wish to go into that other box and tick that box are likely to use. So this is a processing and functioning approach, nothing else. And that's the same for yeah. all the other so predictive it's just, lists. It's people object to the terms, and the census is obviously our most important data gathering exercise. It has status. Absolutely and some, does. Most of those, pe those people, you know, by, not... by, by having those terms in, in the system, if you like, there are clearly some people that feel that they're unhelpful and damaging. So if you could just take that. We absolutely board, hear that. Yeah. OK, um, I think we shall now move on to other areas uh, of the census that have concerns amongst committee members. And I'll go to Mike Rumbles first. Th thank you very much, convener. And what concerns me not, is not more than what we have been discussing is the ethnicity questions. And um, I raised this in the, the last session that came along. And, uh, and that I pointed out that in questions 17 and 18 of the order, um, on, on the ethnic group question, question 18, um, you mix up... Uh, geography and colour. Now, understand why you do that, because what you're trying to do, obviously, is get the best result. You want to get as accurate a result from as many people as possible, and people will answer it in different ways. So I understand why it would appear inconsistent. It still is inconsistent, in my view, but I understand that. Um, on the previous question, 17, about national identity, 
I'm perfectly happy with that national identity question. It's really good. As regards national identity, are you Scottish, English, Northern Irish, Welsh, British, or another? Please say so. That's perfect, because you'll get an accurate response from that. I only tested this how I would fill this in. And I go to question 18 on ethnicity, and I'm confused. I don't know how to answer question 18, because it says, as regards ethnic group, whether white, and if so, whether you're Scottish, or are you other British? Well, I'm Scottish and British. So I'm not going to answer Scottish, because I consider them all British. Um, how, how do I answer? The reason I ask is that on your other questions in the same paragraph, you say, if you're Asian, you can answer Asian, Scottish Asian, or British Asian. If you're African, you can have African, Scottish African, or British African. Or if you're Arab, you can have Arab, or Scottish Arab, or British Arab, but you can't do it in my ethnicity. So I don't know how, literally, I don't know how to answer that question. And I'm only raising this issue because is the information that you're going to get back from people who fill this in, like me, going to be inaccurate? The, the whole question of ethnicity and national identity and how those interrelate, as, as you say, is complicated and is a sensitive issue and is something that has it been evolving from our perspective for, for a number of decades and continues to evolve. So there are different views about how one ought to ask questions when the complexity of how we understand our ethnicity and our national identity and all of the interrelated aspects of this, those continue to evolve. So absolutely, we recognize that. What we have with this question is something that has been broadly developed um, is part of our week in week out social surveys that, that are asked in our population surveys up and down the country and the response from those is that there is a large understanding and ex expect and um, acceptance that people know how to answer that question that's not i'm not saying that every everybody does but what we have there is something that is well tested there has been some discussions, and these will continue um, over the next few months and years and beyond that, about how certain wording and phrases might change. So, for example, I think in the past uh, you mentioned um, so, uh, the, uh, the section that says, it says Asian, Scottish Asian. That used to say Asian Scottish. It's been flipped because that has been seen to be uh, enabling people to, to respond to that question. As I say, in the social service that run week in, week out, people can respond to this. There is another writing box, so if the tick boxes that are there are not something that people feel fully represents what they want to put, they can write in into the other, and that will also be in the predictive one. But, and I'm very sympathetic to, to what you're saying. I'm not trying to... Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure that we get this right. And what I, what I find disappointing, I can say. I think you've done a good job, I may, may say, overall. But what I slightly feel isn't as good as it could be, as I said on paragraph 17, you've got it absolutely right, because you're giving all the options. And may I make a suggestion? Um, people like me would be happy if you were able to replicate that in the next question on ethnicity, because I want to be able to say, I'm British. When I, I can't say, if I, when he says, are you Scottish or other British? That implies you're either English or Welsh. And so that's what causes the confusion. And I think myself, I'm not particularly uh, uh, unusual. And um, I think you might get a lot of people in the same position who then say, well, do I write that in at the bottom as British? It would be much better to say, as you have in the previous question, if you're white, are you Scottish, English, Welsh, British? and then continue the list. That would solve the problem. It's, it's to get you to, to, to get the best and most accurate information possible. And after all, that's what we're trying to do, isn't it? Absolutely. So yeah, thanks, thanks yeah. For, your, for your advice on that. Um, we, as I say, the question, as we have tested and as, is, as used week in, week out, does work. What we need, we can think about, is how we can put guidance, perhaps, around this to help point people to that. And we know that in the predictive text, for that bit that British is is in there. So I don't that, think I'm unusual. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm 
very happy that you've, you've raised that and we, we, will, we will look at that. Thank, but what I would say that. is that the question, as we understand it at this point in time, does But this function. is what the feedback's about, isn't it? Isn't Absolutely it? it is, so thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Donald Cameron. So just a very quick follow-up to, to that, because um, it's on the same subject. On, on 17, and I know I appreciate this is the order, not the actual census, but on 17, national identity, is a respondent able to answer to two of those? Can, can, can you select? All yeah. that are applying, yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Ross Greer. Thanks, convener. Um, so I've raised two issues previously. Um, so the uh, questions are around um, essentially echoing what the um, Association of, of Sikhs in Scotland to raise, and, and their concerns are, are covered, and, and your response to their concerns are covered in the uh, written submission that you've made to the committee. I was just um, wondering about further clarification around the, the concern I raised uh, with regard to how uh, Muslims are asked to, to answer. So that was, uh, for the first time, Muslims were being asked to identify their denomination, if, if, if that's the right phrase. But um, I had some concerns around how clear it was that that's what was being asked. And I was wondering what further work you've done on that. Um, yes, following um, the last session, we have um, engaged with uh, stakeholders in the, uh, with an interest in um, the data that we gather on Muslim. We have, um, I think, just about agreed a set of wording there which more re reflects the what I understand you were proposing to us rather than just to please write in to, to specify that we're asking for um, a denomination or school. So, so yes, that work is in, um, is in hand and, and we're anticipating that that will come forward. And um, again, looking to, to your written uh, submission, where uh, you're considering what the what the potential other responses are. So, and you've Christian, you've got 49 suggestions. So, it's various denominations and, and churches. Uh, Muslim, it's two suggestions. So, am I to presume that's at the at the moment that is Sunni and Shiite? That's correct. Um, it's a slightly more complicated section that yeah. one, um, and there's a number of ways that we could have taken that which will lead to different complications. Um, so certainly for rehearsal, that was the decision that was made, was to, to, to keep it at that level, and largely because that's the user need that's been identified to us. However, it is a free text. People can type in anything that they choose to. Yeah, as, as long as it's clear that that's what's being asked, yeah. I'm sure any, any of, I mean, it'll be a very small number of people, but the community of Muslims in Scotland mm. who are not Sunni or Shia, as yeah. long as it's clear what's being asked, they should yeah. be able to respond. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Stuart McMillan. It's, uh, just on the same area, uh, it's uh, uh, in the order, so it's uh, section 18, just in terms of the, the, the other Asian, Scottish Asian, British Asian, uh, and also the, the African uh, section in D, uh, will there be like, a free text option for people to write in? Yes, uh, both of those are free text. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. What are your plans with regards to the Sikh Federation? Because in your submission, you said that there had been a judicial review which they had lost, but they hadn't been given permission to appeal. But understand from media coverage that they are still saying that they intend to appeal. Is that something that you're keeping a watching eye on? It, it is. We are talking with our colleagues in ONS who are who are closer to this because the the appeal, if, if there is an appeal, will will be to the to the English court. So we are we are, yes. It's the short answer is we are keeping an eye on on developments in that area. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. D just to finish up, I just wanted to go back to this issue that we asked. A number of, of members asked with regards to who the data users were uh, that had asked you for self-ID guidance. Um, and you, you said you didn't want to name names. It's just, it might help. Are you talking about the submission to the committee on the 20th of September from a number of, I think it was 50 academics that uh, wrote in support of self-ID guidance? Is that the academics that you're referring to? Um, if that was the one with, with uh, I think, as you say, if there was 50 signatories to that, that is that is one of the groups of people who yeah. have expressed. I mean, because obviously we know that there's lots of stakeholders and campaigners, yep. and uh, on on behalf of um, the particular community respondents who have lobbied you, but that's a different thing from that 
independent data users. So if we're talking about data users that you have responded to, is it, if it, is it those academics on the 20th September? The, is that the ones we you're We can come back to? on, I mean, if you're asking a, for full details on all the academics who have been, been in touch with us, we, we can come back to you on that. The, there, there was... Um, it's not just academics, though, it's actual data users, yep. people who are saying, we are independent researchers, and this is why yep. we want either we want a biological sex yep. question, a legal sex question, or self-ID sex question. Um, clearly, you have been swayed, you have said, by data users who favour self-identification. So you weren't able to tell us who they were, um, and I'm, uh, I'm suggesting, is it the 20th of September letter from the 50 Academics? Those are some of the people who have, have expressed a need yeah. because, for that. But can I just, sorry. Yeah. Share, In I, contrast sorry. to the letter oh, by okay. Professor Alex Sullivan, uh, uh, Alice Sullivan, which is very senior, mainly professors who are uh, social researchers, economic researchers, that 20th of September letter is not so senior people and it doesn't say in most cases, what their expertise is. But I've looked up some of them, and I'm not going to name them because that wouldn't be fair. Um, but they include professors of medieval literature, or uh, researchers into medieval literature, materials chemistry, uh, computer studies, that sort of thing. Is it fair to give weight to that group who are not actually data users, they're just academics who feel strongly about this, as opposed to Professor Sullivan's group, who are 80 very, very senior social researchers, economic researchers, people interested in uh, experts in medical sociology, and people like Professor McVeigh, who actually sits on the government's advisory group on statistics. I'm just, I'm just confused as to why you're favouring this other group, who don't have that expertise. I don't... The idea that we are judging and therefore finding certain voices, I, I don't necessarily um, hold. What we are doing is saying this is how the question has been asked, this is how guidance has been used, and we are clarifying that, and there is a need for guidance. Some of this discussion that is happening, which is hugely helpful as part of this scrutiny process, is pulling out where people have made an assumption about how questions may have been asked in the past. Um, so clarification of how that question is being asked and the need for guidance is helpful. Okay. We know that other data users, be that in the health system or elsewhere, see the use of the information in, the, in their context and know that they will use other information, as will, will many academics. So a number of the people who were uh, part of that group of 80 will be using other sources of operational and management information in order to do the very important work that they do. And what we are clear from the advice we have been given by some of the people that you have just mentioned is that it is critical that the guidance is clear where we are using guidance and that so that data users can understand the basis on okay. which they then use data but there is the census is a certain tool that does a certain set of things there is a vast amount of administrative and other social data that others gather and they use that for all sorts of other purposes okay. these okay. these are all part of of adding to to the wealth of knowledge okay. i don't think we're going to go to get any further on that Finally, and this really is finally, you said earlier that the sex question has always been a self-identified response. You said that in the committee earlier. So would your view be that back in 1921 that the sex question was a self-ID response? What I said is that, if I'm clear on this, is that people respond to that question in the way that they feel best reflects yeah. the way they wish to answer that question. Therefore, self-identification becomes our sense of how people are answering it's that just, when you look yeah. across the whole population. It's, it's just that back in 1921, a 25-year-old woman answering that question didn't have the right to vote. 
And no. it didn't matter if she identified as a man, she still wouldn't have the right to vote. No. So sex is important. It's not something that you can erase simply by changing your gender identity. Would you agree with that? I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking me to, okay. to, to debate now. I'm trying to talk about the census and putting a credible product into the public domain so that people up and down this country can engage in it. Thank you very much uh, for coming to give evidence to us today. We we'll now suspend briefly. The next item on the agenda is written by annual updates from the Scottish Government in relation to a range of EU issues. Uh, members have a copy of the updates in the meeting paper, so do any members have any questions or issues that they wish to raise? Annabelle Ewing. Um, so I had a, a look through the papers. Um, a few points. One, obviously there have been developments with Erasmus this week in the House of Commons, and I think we need to get further information about that because by all accounts it's very worrying indeed. The, the upshot of that. Uh, secondly, um, uh, again, uh, the issue of horizon, post horizon. Uh, I know that the Scottish Government is seeking clarity from the UK Government, and I'm not quite sure what the role for the committee would be at this point, but obviously that's huge implications. And lastly, the 
I note that the government actually had launched, a, 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 established a steering group on post-structural funds, uh, and uh, there's a consultation out at the moment with a view to there being a report in the spring, but apparently spring is summer, according to the civil service. So it's just to have a watch out for that, because I think it would be useful then to get Ivan McKee in, you know, a bit later on in that process to hear yes. what the steering group are suggesting yeah. further to the consultation. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Annabel. Kenneth? To December 2018, in response to a question in the comments from uh, Patricia Gibson, MP, the Prime Minister of the day, Theresa May said that an announcement would be made on the Shared Prosperity Fund before Christmas. That's 13 months later, there's still not been any progress on that that I'm aware of. And as we can see from the letter from Ivan McKee, um, uh, ESF programme is placed in full suspension on the 15th of November. So I think as a committee, we would want to press the UK government to get some detail on that and uh, what the implications are and whether or not um, the, the, the funds that are being lost will be uh, restored. There's been, there's been, they've been saying for over a year that they would, but we don't have anything in hard evidence. There doesn't seem to be any real financial commitment at, at, that we can see at this point in time to that. Thank you very much. Stuart McMillan. Uh, uh, thanks, Convener. Just uh, following on from Annabelle Ewing's point regarding the Erasmus, uh, certainly the developments in the, in the House of Commons uh, yesterday uh, are deeply worrying. Uh, I know that our committee uh, has previously undertaken work regarding Erasmus Plus. Uh, and I'll put it on record again as someone who actually has benefited from studying through an Erasmus scheme and also European Social Fund. You know uh, fair, Stuart. Uh, then I know how <laughs> beneficial uh, it actually is. This is a public session. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I, genuinely, uh, I genuinely believe that uh, I think uh, it would be very useful for us to actually write to, the, uh, to both the Scottish Government and also to the UK Government uh, on the back of these developments uh, to try to obtain again, any, any, any further information or any, any further uh, guidance from them regarding what may or may not come uh, in a, in a post-Brexit uh, situation uh, without... Uh, so, uh, as we currently have an Erasmus scheme. Yeah. Ross Graham. Thanks. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said so far, and particularly Stuart McMillan's point around <coughs> writing to, to both governments. Um, there's very little more that the Scottish Government can inform us than what they already have because they are receiving so little information. I know if we ask a Scottish Government Minister to appear before us, I'm sure they will. Um, but clearly, we need far more information from the UK Government than they've been providing thus far, either to ourselves or to the, UK, uh, to the uh, Scottish Government. Um, I think we should ask UK Ministers to appear before the, the committee. Getting written information from them is one thing. We should ask them to appear before the committee I say that accepting the very uh, low response rate we have had to previous requests from the UK government to appear before us, but we should make that request and we should make it on the record because anything short of that, we are simply not going to receive the information that we require. Thank you. Michael Rumbles. Um, just looking at some of the statistics in the reports before us, um, what struck me is um, the remarkable decline in French and German modern language teachers in our secondary schools has been compensated by an increase in Spanish and other European languages. But French and German are major um, trading partners and uh, major nations in, in the EU. And uh, I wondered if we could get an explanation as to what the Scottish... Well, is the Scottish Government concerned about this? And if it is, what it's doing about it? Mm -hmm. I know that there were other modern languages as mm -hmm. well as Spanish, which mm -hmm. were not named, yeah. uh, had increased yes, as well. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point, yes. Any other yes. points, Claire Baker? Uh, yeah, linked to uh, Mike Rumble's point, um, in the letter from John Swinney, he also talks about the survey that was done. Um, he says that the survey indicates that it's 70% of secondary schools who are given the full one plus two languages uh, delivery. It's just to confirm that we, we will, as a committee, receive a copy of the... They said that the results have been analysed. Will we receive a full copy of the... I think that will give us more detail on what languages yeah. have been offered and the extent and where the geographical focus is. Yeah. That would be helpful. OK, thanks. Ken? Yeah, following from what Ross has said, I mean, I completely agree with him. We're all well aware that the UK government say, um, are less than enthusiastic about sending UK ministers. But what about the Scotland office? If the UK ministers themselves are not willing to come, surely they can send a proxy from the Scotland office to, to this committee. OK, thank you for that. Ross Greer? 
Thanks. And just uh, briefly to follow up the, the points that Mike raised around modern languages, uh, the Education Committee are, are doing some work related to this as part of wider work on the senior phase. So if, if we were to write to the Education Committee, which I also sit on, if we were to write to the Education Committee and ask that some of the specific questions that have been raised here are taken up yeah. as part of their inquiry. I, I was going to suggest that. Oh, so th thanks. Excellent. Any other points? Okay, can I suggest, uh, well, I would just agree with the points that members ha have raised. Um, particularly the work we did in Erasmus was of a very high quality and uh, I think it's important that we keep on keep on top of that. And I'll just draw attention as well to, to the letter from Mr Lockhead about Horizon 2020, which is, you know, like the, the guarantees offered by the UK government uh, only, only go so far and it mentions that parts of Horizon 2020 are unlikely to be open to the UK as an unassociated third country and mentions uh, significant loss of income to research organisations uh, in Scotland, depending on the Brexit date. So I would be uh, keen to, well, the first thing I was going to do is suggest that the points that we have raised here, um, we raise with Scottish ministers, perhaps in a letter from myself and the deputy convener uh, to sign off that covers all these points. Um, but also I'm, I'm getting from members that they would also like us to raise some of these issues with the UK government. We are the decision makers in many of these matters. So um, we'll, we'll do something similar uh, with that regard. We can now move into private session. Thank you very much.